Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be breaking down the Saturday night slate for college football DFS for week two of the 2024 season. This is the Saturday, September 7th, 7 p.m. slate. We've got a lot of juicy games going on. I got to be real honest, y'all. This is a really, really nice slate. We've got nine games, which is pretty sizable for a night slate in, in its own right. But those nine games are really intriguing. There are a lot of very stackable games on this slate, which is going to leave us to make the decision when we make our lineups of which game do I stack? What is my secondary stack? Who's the one-off piece I want? Who, you know, do I onslaught the game with both quarterbacks? You know, there's just a lot of options in terms of stacking on this slate, which to me makes it very intriguing. There's also some guys with some quite honestly mispriced tags that I think we can take advantage of as well. So we're going to break it all down here in this video for you. If you have not already, make sure you check out our Saturday Main Slate episode. Um, so check out the YouTube channel, just scroll down, or check out the audio feed as well, um, and check out the Saturday Main Slate video if you have not already. But um, here on this episode, we're going to be solely focused on the night slate. Um, so if you are looking for the main slate, this is not the one you're looking for, um, make sure you go check out the other one. Now, um, before I get started, I do want to mention, make sure you subscribe to the channel. That way you can be with us for the rest of the college football season, and you can be with us for the night slates, the main slates, the midweek slates, all the sites we end up making content for. You can be with us for that. And while you're at it, please hit the like button for this video. It really does help me out a ton when you guys do that. I really do appreciate it, and I cannot stress enough how much that helps. And if you are listening on audio, you can rate and review the podcast. Those help out a ton as well, and I really do appreciate it. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into this Saturday night slide. All right, game number one on the slate is a rematch of what was honestly one of the worst games of football of the 2023 season. I feel like I speak can speak pretty comfortably on that one. South Florida heading to Tuscaloosa to take on Alabama. They played last year in the game with 17 to three. That was the infamous Jalen Milrow benching game um, where, you know, Alabama had lost to Texas. They tried to bench Jalen Milrow for that game. Their offense did not have very much success at all with Ty Simpson or Tyler Buckner. Just an ugly, ugly slog of a game. South Florida had not yet really gotten their offense going for the season, and they were unable to do anything. Just an awful football game. This one projects to be much different. Right now, Alabama is 29.5 point favorites with a game total of 64.5 points, meaning the projected score is about 47 to 18 in favor of Bama. So why such a contrast? Well, we just mentioned how South Carolina or South Florida really hadn't gotten their offense going. Well, now they are fully under the command of Byron Brown, who is a dual threat quarterback who can put up points in a hurry. And Alabama has fully given the reins to Jalen Milrow. Alabama now with Kalen DeBoer as a head coach and the offensive play caller, they're going to play at a much faster tempo. South Florida going to play at fast tempo. So there's going to be a lot of plays that get off in this game. And, you know, we know more plays is going to equal more fantasy points. Now, Byron Aaron Brown did have 11 fantasy points in the same matchup last season, but I think he's in line for much better than that here in this game. You know, they're projected 18 points, so if they get two touchdowns, he gets one passing, one rushing touchdown. He can give you value at a salary of only $5,200. And really, I think that's a very reasonable possibility. He is a dual threat. He can run as well as throw. I don't think this is the best spot for him in terms of matchup and game flow, but it's a $5,200 salary. He's certainly got to be in play as a salary saver so that we can get to some of the other higher priced options on this slate. At the running back spot for South Florida, um, Kelly Joyner was the surprise RB1 in their last game, led the team in attempts, yards, scored two touchdowns. Naquan Wright was the guy that everybody expected to be the RB1, but he kind of took a backseat to Joyner. Joyner, I feel the same way about as I feel Byron Brown. Like this is a guy in a good offense, good system, not a great matchup against Alabama, but a very reasonable price tag, $3,500 on DraftKings that makes him palatable as a play on this slate. At the running backs or the wide receiver spots, excuse me, South Florida got a clear wide receiver one at Sean Atkins. Um, don't be fooled by the numbers. He was their by far best receiver last year. He most comfortable target with Byron Brown. He had six targets in the game against Bethune Cookman, and really that was a game where they didn't have to throw the ball a whole lot. I think he's due for a much bigger workload in this one and as the season goes on. Brown, Stevens, and Yasmin are the other two starters in this receiver room for South Florida. I got to say, I'm much less interested in the two of them than I am Sean Atkins because they're a similar price tag, and I know that Atkins has the pedigree to be wide receiver one and by a much wider margin than the price. Now, on the Alabama side, Jalen Milrow was outstanding against um, Western Kentucky in the first game, put up 39 fantasy points, only needed nine attempts passing to do so, only needed 10 rushing attempts to do so, scored five total touchdowns, right? Like just a very efficient day. This is a much tougher matchup, but I think objectively, you look at all the quarterbacks on the slate, 
if I had to pick any quarterback, say, hey, Mike, who's the quarterback that's going to score the most points on this slate? You know who I'd pick? I'd pick Jalen Milrow. So if that's the objective, if you're just looking for the quarterback who's going to score the most points, Milrow is an option. And I think the a sneaky little game stack here, Brown and Milrow, you, you could get a, a pricey quarterback and a cheap quarterback, and it kind of evens out. Both of the two of them can put up fantasy points in bunches. At the running back spot for Alabama, Haynes and Miller, it, it's a pure committee. Um it's a good matchup for them going up against South Florida, but it's hard to feel confident in them when they're over $7,000 and you know that they're going to split carries. If you play one of them, it would just be hoping that that's the one that gets the touchdown or touchdowns. And I think that they're nothing more than a shot in a GPP, in my opinion. I don't think you can play them with confidence in cash games. I don't think you can play them in confidence if you're playing like one or three lineups here on this slide. At the wide receiver spot, look, I'm still a believer in Jeremy Bernard. Um, he only had one catch for 17 yards against Western Carolina, but again, Milrow only threw 10 passes. Um, he knows this system. He came over with Kalen DeBoer. He, he should be the guy in the system. Ryan Williams is the freshman phenom who caught two passes for 139 yards and two touchdowns against Western Kentucky. Look, he's not going to be able to do that every game, but he's at a very reasonable price tag at 4500 that if he just gives you one of those long touchdowns, he's going to pay for his salary immediately. So um, I'm still still into my guns with Bernard and Williams as the two wide receivers that I want to target for Bama. And I think you can play Milrow stack or unstacked. I wouldn't have a problem playing Milrow, Milrow unstacked without these receivers because he is a dual threat rush. Next game up is going to be Georgia Southern taking on Nevada. And this one is interesting. This line right now is a lot closer than I think it would have been two or three weeks ago because of how the two teams have played since, since then. Um, Georgia Southern is one and a half point favorites heading to Nevada. The game total is 58 and a half, meaning the projected total is about 30 to 28 in favor of Georgia Southern. And look, that makes this a very stackable game, very close spread, very high total, very stackable environment, right? And Nevada has really showed themselves well through two weeks so far. So I think they're getting a lot of respect on this line. And I think that this is a game that can really has shootout potential. On the Georgia Southern side, we didn't really know who their starting quarterback was going to be throughout much of camp, but against Boise, it was J.C. French. Georgia Southern is an air raid team who plays at a fast tempo. J.C. French threw 50 passes in that game against Boise, put up 35 fancy points. He was great. He does run as well, 16 rushing attempts in that game. Now, obviously, a few of those are sacks, but he does give you a little bit of mobility as well. Only $6,500 in this slate. He's a great play. I, I think objectively, he's probably the best points per hour play at the quarterback position on this slate, um, and he's going to be a guy that's going to be in a lot of my lineups. At the running back spot, it's also another great spot for Georgia Southern because Jalen White is their workhorse back. He only had 11 attempts in that game, but three of them were touchdowns. They love to run in the red zone. Yes, they're an air raid team, but when they get down near the goal line, they're going to be giving Jalen White the ball. He also had four catches in the pass game um, on four targets, so he's a guy that does get usage in that air raid offense as a part of the passing game. Only $4,800, and he's really the only guy that's going to play significant snaps. Yet yeah, Jalen White is a great points per dollar play at 4,800 as well in this Georgia Southern offense. At the wide receiver spot, here's more good news. Not only is this team going to have a big load of passing volume, but it's very condensed in how they do it. Burgess and Cobb are very clearly the top two wide receivers in this offense in terms of the targets, in terms of the snap counts, in terms of the fantasy production. Burgess had nine targets in that game against Boise, ended up with 13 fantasy points. Cobb had eight targets in that game against Boise, ended up with 18 fantasy points. These are the two guys that you want. It is a massive rotation after the those two guys. Now, the listed starters are Josh Dallas and LV Bunkley Shelton. Um, so I think they're playable as like GPP options. But I think that you could go full on with a Georgia Southern stack of French at quarterback, Burgess and Cobb at receiver, and have a ton of salary left over to pay up at a lot of the other spots in your lineup. I think this Georgia Southern offense is a very, very good one to play on this slate. Very easy to get to because the low salaries and the condensation of their offense. If you want to be contrarian and you're not going to play J.C. French, then Jalen White makes the sense as a really, really solid play because if French were to fail, it would likely mean that he's not scoring touchdowns, and so who would be scoring the touchdowns? Jalen White. I, I think that it's definitely worthwhile to get a piece of this Georgia Southern offense. On the Nevada side, like I said, they've acquitted themselves very well in the last few weeks. Brendan Lewis um, has exceeded expectations as a starter through two games, um, had a little over 20 fancy points against SMU, a little under 20 fancy points in their victory against Troy, averaging out at about 20. He's only $6,000. His team's projected to score 28 points. I don't think he's a great quarterback, but I don't mind the play in terms of a points per hour option at the quarterback position. And oh, by the way, if you want to just stack this game up, it's a very, very cheap game stack with a two quarterback 
quarterbacks being under seven thousand dollars both of them at the running back spot for nevada this is where it gets interesting Oh, and, and oh, by the way, um, I mentioned that Lewis had 20 fantasy points in both games. This George's Southern defense is likely the worst one that he's seen to this point. So it's probably the best matchup that, that he's had so far. At the running back spot, this is another really good matchup for the Nevada running backs because Georgia Southern just gave up over 250 rushing yards to Ashton Genty in week one. Um, so this is a team that can be had running the football. Savion Red kind of took over as the RB1 in their game against Troy, leading the team in carries with 11, leading the team in yards with 135. Very clearly the number one option in the backfield in week one against Troy. Whether that stays is to be seen, but I would think Red would be the guy you want. Sean Bowers is going to get his carries. He will be a factor in this offense. And Pat Garbo is a bigger back who they are going to use in the red zone. They've already shown that ability. Um, so I don't mind getting to any of those three running backs, knowing that this is a absolutely atrocious run defense that Georgia Southern has. Um, so I think that all three are worth a look. But again, Red would be my preference. At the wide receiver spot for Nevada, I really only have interest in one. That's Jaden Smith. Um, he has been the target leader for two games. Um, he was targeted nine times against SMU, six times against Troy. Has not found the end zone yet, which is why his fantasy production isn't super high. But I will take the guy getting steady, consistent volume any time of the week and just hope and pray that he eventually sees some touchdown regression. Bram, I think is how you pronounce it, is another guy who's seen pretty steady targets, had seven targets against SMU, was not as productive in their game against Troy. But I think that Smith and Bram are the two guys you want, and I think you can ignore the rest of the receiving core after that. Game number three is going to be Kansas taking on Illinois. This is rematch. Well, I should say return match. This is a home and home series that started last year. Um, Kansas won 34 to 23 last season. And right now, Kansas is five and a half point favorites in this game with a total of 55 and a half, meaning the projection is about 30 to 25 in favor of the Jayhawks, um, which kind of tracks with what we saw last year, 34 to 23, right? Like it's not that far off from that. Now on the Kansas side, J1 Daniels at quarterback, we know he's good, and he just straight underwhelmed in week one. Look, he just didn't get the touchdowns. Like that team going up against Lindenwood, Lindenwood was not on their level. They could score however they wanted to score Kansas, and they just so happened that they didn't score with Jalen Daniels. He didn't use his legs as a rusher at all, which is what he's known for, just because he didn't have to in that game. So $8,300 coming into this game, I'm willing to buy the dip and buy low on Jalen Daniels. And, you know, like we've talked about all these salary saver options in these first few games. If you're going to spend your salary somewhere, he's not a bad option to do it, nor is Devin Neal. Devin Neal is one of the most efficient backs in the country, only he needed eight carries against Lindenwood to put up 26 fantasy points. Look, Illinois is a lot better than Lindenwood, but still Devin Neal, very efficient player, very good offensive line he's running behind. Really like the spot he's in for $7,900. Like I said, there's all these salary savers on this slate, so you can afford to pay up for some guys. Devin Neal's a great pay-up option. In my opinion, he's probably objectively my favorite running back on the slate. If you were just asking me, hey, Mike, what running back is going to score the most points on the slate, I would tell you Devin Neal of Kansas. At the wide receiver position for Kansas, um, Grimm was their guy in week one. Um, you know, nine targets, caught six of them, 111 yards and a touchdown. Last year, the gap was not that big. You saw a little more even usage as the season went on between Grimm and Skinner and Arnold. That's why they're all still priced the same, I guess, because DraftKings has some priors in from last season. But what tends to happen is one of them tends to have the big game, and then the other one tends to have the big game, and it just kind of alternates, right? So Grimm is the last one coming off the big game. So the question is, do you think Grimm is going to follow that up with another big game, or do you think that the pattern from last year is going to continue and either Skinner or Arnold has the big game? Look, I think these are guys that I'm probably not playing outside of stacks with Jalen Daniels. I'm probably not going to get the, these guys as one-offs just because there is so much volatility. But if you're playing one with Daniels, I think all three got to get consideration from you. Do not do not get tunnel vision on Grimm just because he was the last one that had a big game. And I think the field is probably going to do that. I think a, the, in terms of ownership, Grimm is going to significantly more own than Skinner and Arnold. So um, I think that would be some leverage if you were to take a shot at the other receivers. On the Illinois side, Luke Altmaier is – serviceable at quarterback like he's not a bad quarterback i don't think he's great either um he had 27 fantasy points against eastern illinois he had 27 fantasy points in the game last year against kansas that they lost um you know he had two rushing touchdowns in that matchup so he does give you a little bit of rushing upside he's not a bad points per hour play at 7200 but i think objectively there's better plays out there so I think he's going to be fairly lowly owned. I, I, I think he's an option on this slate. I don't think he's the best option, but I think he is an option. 
At the running back spot, they're going to keep it with a workhorse back, Caden Fegan. Um, he's a big old boy. Like, he's probably about 230, 240 pounds, hard to bring down. Um, he's going to need a big workload to hit value against this Kansas team, but he's going to get a big workload against this Kansas team. So I don't think he's a bad option at 4,900 hours. At the wide receiver spot, so the last two years – Illinois had this absolute target monster in Isaiah Williams where pretty much all the design touches were going to him, all the RPOs were going to him. And then when they had like needed a play on like third and medium, you knew the ball was going to Isaiah Williams, right? He was just a target machine. Well, it appears this year that it's now going to be Pat Bryant that might be that. Um, five catches, 63 yards, two of which were touchdowns against Eastern Illinois. He was the most targeted receiver in that first matchup. I'm still interested in Zachary Franklin, though. He's a transfer from Old Miss that was a transfer from UTSA. He was a great receiver at UTSA two years ago when they had him and uh, Frank Harris in that offense. I'm still interested in him. I'm holding out hope that he can be what he was two years ago. So Bryant could very well be the guy, but I'm, I'm still holding out some hope that Franklin could be the guy as well. I, I don't think they're terrible plays on this slate, and I think you would want to play them stacked with Allmeyer. Next up, we have Virginia heading to Winston-Salem to take on the Wake Forest Demon Deacons. Um, Wake is currently two-and-a-half-point favorites in this one with a total of 56-and-a-half, um, which means the projected total is about 29-27 to 27 in favor of the Deeks. Um, Virginia is interesting because they did something that made fantasy players everywhere happy in week one. They finally started Anthony Calandria over Tony Musket. He's just a much more exciting, high-ceiling player than Musket. And he showed it in week one by putting up 30 fantasy points against Richmond. That's not going to be the case every time. But look, this Wake defense is not great. This game environment's pretty good. He's got rushing upside. I don't mind the play at $7,300 for Calandria. And these are two teams that are going to play at a decent tempo. So there's going to be a shootout potential here. I don't mind Calandria at 7300 at the running back spots, another position that I don't mind, Kobe Pace is going to be the workhorse back for Virginia. He's a uh, Clemson transfer. Um, he only carried the ball 11 times against Richmond, but that's because he was really all he was needed to do. To do. Um, I think when push comes to shove, he is the guy in this offense, and a salary of $5,100 is quite reasonable to pay for that. At the wide receiver spot for Virginia, last year they very famously had um, Malik Washington as a big-time, big-time target monster in the offense. Now it looks like it's going to be Malachi Fields. He's targeted six times against Richmond, caught five of them for 100 yards, did not score a touchdown that game. So he only ended up with 18 fantasy points, could have been much more. So he's priced up very high, but it's for a reason, and I think he's worth every penny. Um, you know, we talked about all these pay-down options on this slate, but you got to pay up somewhere. Malachi Fields is a great pay-up option, in my opinion. And then I'm still interested in Chris Tyree. So Chris Tyree is a transfer from Notre Dame who's quite talented. And he's very fast. Um, he did not play in week one against Richmond. He's been banged up. So maybe, just maybe, now that they're playing a conference game, you know, do they decide to, you know, roll him out there, see what he can do? I think he's their second best uh, receiver, clearly behind Fields, that probably their best overall athlete. And at $3,900, that's a high ceiling player that obviously is going to carry some risk, but I think he's worth it. I would definitely want some confirmation that he's out on the field warming up or something like that before kickoff, before I just put him in my lineups. Now, on the Wake Forest side, they went with a QB committee in week one, but it ended up being Hank Bachmeyer that ended up being the guy. Um, he's probably going to be the guy again this week. Um, he's okay like he's a transfer from boise and louisiana tech not exactly a great resume for a guy that you want to start in the acc but he was efficient against north carolina a and t he's only fifty seven hundred dollars on this slate i think he's a very reasonable game stacking option if you want to play quandry and bachmeyer that's a very cheap option to stack this game up and i don't mind it at the running back spot again much like virginia wake has a workhorse running back demond claiborne is their guy in the backfield he is going to be their guy in the backfield throughout the season and I think this is a pretty good spot for him uh, against Virginia. I think that Wake might actually, this is one of the games where they will have the advantage on the offensive line. And so $4,900, great price tag. You know he's going to get probably 20 touches. Great option in DeMond Claiborne. If you want to stack this game up and not play the quarterbacks, then he's the way that you can get to it. And I think that you can play him in that type of a lineup or you can play him as a one-off. At the wide receiver spot, 
Taylor Morin is their slot guy. He was their most effective player against North Carolina A&T. He did have a return touchdown. That's how he ended up at 25 fantasy points. But he's kind of been the slot for this Wake Forest offense for the last few years. Gets steady targets, steady usage. If he scores a touchdown, he's going to pay off his price tag. The other two starters are Fields and Green. I think that Fields is okay. I think that Green is the better player and probably the best player out of all three of the starters. Had 16 fantasy points against NCA and T. I think Green's a really, really solid option. And then Alexander down here at 17.9. Um, I'm sorry, down here at 3,600 for his price tag. Had 17.9 fantasy points in week one. He's not a bad option. He is the fourth receiver in this offense. He plays in 10 personnel. Um but he led them in targets with eight in week one. So um, Deuce Alexander, not out of the question as an option at 3,600. I'm worried he might be a little bit chalky just because I think what people tend to do, people who don't do the research, people who don't watch these videos, they tend to just see the fantasy points per game, see the price tag, and make a click based off of that. So I think Alexander is probably going to get some ownership. But like I said, I think that Green or Morin, Fields, Green, Alexander, they're all four in play. They're all four going to see some targets here in this game. All right, that does it for the first four games. Let's take a quick breather, and then we are going to break down the next. Now, I do want to remind you guys, there is a way you can get more information from me. First off, you can follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have, any start, sit, lineup questions. Um, and if there's any any like injury news or anything like that that changes my opinion um, in between recording and when the slate happens, I do try to tweet it out as well. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions about that stuff. So just reach out to me on Twitter if you need anything. Also, I'm in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description on YouTube as well as on the audio feed. Um, the Fantasy Corner Discord's got a lot of people who play a lot of DFS for a lot of different sports. A lot of really smart, really good people in there who are looking to help, looking to talk up strategy, talk up plays. Um, and it's just a great environment to talk DFS. If you're looking for more people to talk DFS with, I cannot recommend it enough. Join it. Um, and then I do write an article on my Patreon for every single college football DFS slate where I profile my core plays and my strategy and thinking for the slate. Now, I can't just sit here and guarantee that you're going to, you know, play them and win thousands of dollars. It's not that easy. But college football DFS is still a solvable game. It's not a game where people have all the sims and optimizers and all that fancy stuff like you're dealing with an NFL, baseball and NBA. It's a game where a lot of guys that play it are are people like me who do their research and and you know make um, decisions off of that. So what you can do is you can get information from me in terms of like how to strategize, how to build lineups, um, and you know who I'm playing and build your own process and get better at college football DFS that way. So if you're looking for that, patreoncom slash picks. All right, let's go ahead and continue with game number five, which is taking place in Charlotte, North Carolina, neutral site game between Tennessee and NC State. The spread is currently Tennessee minus seven and a half. The total is currently 61 and a half, meaning the projection is about 34 to 27 in favor of the Volunteers. This line has moved a lot since the preseason because NC State was not very impressive last week against Western Carolina, but I think this game can go over. I think that this has shootout written all over it. Both of these offenses are better than they showed. Tennessee really didn't have to show a whole lot against Chattanooga to score. NC State, they had two non-converted fourth downs. They had a red zone mishap. I can't remember whether it was a missed field goal or a turnover um, in the red zone. But, like, they very easily could have blown out Western Carolina. They also had an ineligible man downfield penalty that killed a touchdown to Justin Jolly. So, like, they were really close from winning that game in a blowout. And everybody seems to think that Tennessee is now going to blow NC State out because State didn't blow Western Carolina out. Well, nine times out of ten, that NC State game turns into a blowout. Tennessee's also got a very young secondary that is very untested. And if the state passing offense can test it, then we're going to see some points. And we know that Tennessee plays at a super fast tempo. Um, so if there's going to be a lot of scoring, Tennessee games really tend to shoot out because of the tempo that they play at. Now, for Tennessee, Nico was just pretty good against Chattanooga, right? Um, you know, they won 69-3. Nico put up 28 fancy points. He can run as well. Decent matchup against NC State. Not a bad play. I think you can stack them up as well. Dylan Sampson is one of the best running back plays in the slate. Um, he is a workhorse running back. He is the guy in this backfield. Um, he only had 12 carries against Chattanooga, but that's because that was how long the game was in question. Scored three touchdowns in that game, put up 39 fancy points. I don't think you can expect 39 against NC State. NC State's a pretty good defense, but he is the guy. He is very reasonably priced. He's a great play. He's going to be popular. Selden was the second running back to see carries in that game against Chattanooga. So if you're looking to get cute, get fancy, Selden would be the guy that you want to go with. 
at the wide receiver position. Dante Thornton broke off some big plays in that game, 100 yards receiving two touchdowns on three catches. He's going to be the guy that people play. But I'm going to caution you on that. He only played 17 snaps in week one. The snap distribution was very interesting. All right. White, Brazil, and McCoy are the three starters. All three of them played over 43 snaps in week one. We just mentioned Thornton played 17. Nimrod played 25. So really, it's going to be a bit of a rotation at receiver. I don't think you can rely on the big plays from Thornton week in and week out, but he's going to play. He's going to be a part of the lineup. $3,600. I expect him to be popular because of how much fantasy points he scored in his price tag, but I would much rather play a guy who's going to be on the field more like White, like Brazil, like McCoy, all three of whom are very reasonably priced. On the NC State side, we talked about, um, you know, the passing offense having some hits and misses. Well, Grayson McCall, um, you know, from Coastal Carolina, he was really good at Coastal Carolina. I think he has a chance to be really good for NC State. Only $7,700, really, really reasonably priced. This is a game stack that it's one of the higher totals on the slate. You can get to a McCall Nico stack by using a lot of those salary savers that we talked about from earlier in the video. Um, and I think that this is a very reasonable game stack and opportunity for both those guys. This is another very clear workhorse back situation with Jordan Waters getting 20 carries against Western Carolina. I tend to think that how you target this Tennessee team, at least right now, is through the air, not by running the ball. Um, so I think that would make Waters a little more of a contrarian play as opposed to a great on paper play here in this one. At the wide receiver spot, KC Concepcion, a Kevin Concepcion, a lot of people call him KC, was great against Western Carolina. He had 13 targets in that game. He's going to continue to be the guy in this offense. Great receiver. I think he's underpriced at 7,600. Um, like I said, I think this Tennessee secondary is unproven. If he gets 13 targets again, look out. He's going to put up a lot of fantasy points. Now, Collins and Rodgers are the other two starters. I'm going to hold out hope for Rodgers because I do believe in his talent. Um, you know, he's an Ohio State transfer, big-time recruit, um, very reasonable price tag. I'm a believer in Rodgers. I'm going to continue to play him. I think you can play McCall single-stacked or double-stacked, and I think if you were to do it double-stacked, Concepcion and Rodgers is very affordable. Concepcion and Justin Jolly, the tight end, is also very affordable. Remember, I said he had a touchdown call back. He would have had over 20 fantasy points if he did not have that touchdown call back in week one. He's still $3,800. Um, very, very solid play. Very athletic tight end is a matchup nightmare. I really like these the, the first four NC State receivers, Concepcion, Collins, Rodgers, and Jolly, and, and I think that this is a great game to target because of that very young, very unproven Tennessee secondary. Next up, we have Colorado heading to the Plains to take on Nebraska. Nebraska is currently seven and a half point favorites with a total of 58 and a half, meaning the projection is about 33 to 26. These are vastly different teams than the last time these two teams played a year ago, so I'm not even going to really reference that one. On the Colorado side, Shadur Sanders is looking to follow up a great performance from week one where he had 37 fancy points against North Dakota State. This is a step up in competition from what he saw last week in terms of the defense. He's also on the road as opposed to at home. But the good news is they were back to playing at a fast tempo. They were back to being a high volume passing offense. I thought heading into week one that he was unreasonably priced. I full faded him and I was wrong and I'm willing to admit that. Um, this is a guy that gives you no rushing upside. He needs multiple touchdowns and at least 300 yards to pay off his salary. It's a very narrow pathway, but as we saw from week one, it is a pathway that he absolutely can do it. If you are playing him, play him with, in my opinion, exactly two of his wide receivers. I would play him double stack. I would not play him single stack because you know that there's going to be a ton of passing volume and you know that there's no rushing upside. At the running back spot, I am going to pass on the Colorado running backs. Um, they only had 10 total running back carries. I'm sorry, no, 14 total running back carries in week one, five of which went to Offerdahl, nine of which went to Dallin Hayden. It's just a full fade situation for me. This team's going to throw, 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 throw. Their offensive line is not built to move people um, in a way that is going to need a big-time run game. So what you would need is one of these guys to have a big-time receiving game. The more likely of the two to do so would be Dallin Hayden. But, again, this is an avoid situation until I see otherwise. At the wide receiver spot, Travis Hunter really put up a great stat line in week one. Nine targets, seven catches, 132 yards, three touchdowns, 41 fantasy points, and he does not play 100% of the snaps at wide receiver. Um, I talked about last week, I'm probably not going to be getting to him in my DFS lineups because he doesn't play 100% of the snaps at wide receiver. He's going to be needed to play corner. So 
I just don't necessarily agree with paying over $9,000 on DraftKings for a non-full-time player. That's just me. If you want to go with it, you want to stack him up with Shadur, knock yourself out. I, I get it. He's super talented. He's going to earn targets. But I just don't like the idea of not playing or of playing a non-full-time player. Jimmy Horn Jr. was very clearly the guy who had the second connection with Shadur Sanders, had all, nine targets also, 198 yards and a touchdown for 35 fantasy points. If you're playing another Colorado receiver, this would be my guy. He would be my favorite of the Colorado receivers. Wester and Shepard are going to play a lot of snaps, but Wester had seven targets in that game. Shepard had three. I don't really know how those two are going to shake out just yet. It appears to me after week one that Travis Hunter is the most talented guy in the group, but he's still not going to play 100% of the snaps. Jimmy Horn Jr. very clearly had the next best connection with Shadur Sanders. On the Nebraska side, Dylan Rayola was okay against UTEP, but that was all they needed, right? It was it was UTEP. They won 40 to 7. N not really gaudy fancy numbers, but he's super talented. We know this Colorado defense is not that good. I don't think he's the best points per dollar play at $8,000, but I think he's going to make my player pool. At the running back spot, this is just a massive committee for Nebraska. It's kind of a mess. But Colorado is so bad at defending the run that I'm probably going to take a shot at one of them. And that shot's going to be at Dante Dowdell. He only had eight carries, but put up 55 yards and scored a touchdown against UTEP. But what matters to me is that it was the first touchdown. So when the starters were out there, he was he was the one that was out there. He is probably the guy who has the most upside for that reason, in my opinion. This is still going to be committee central. They're still going to split carries. But I think when push comes to shove, based off what they showed me in week one, Dowdell is going to be the guy. Only $3,500. That's a very reasonable price tag. At the wide receiver spot, you got Jamal Banks, the Wake Forest transfer. I think he is going to see the Travis Hunter shadow because I think he is the most talented player in this receiving core. Isaiah Nayer had a really good week one, though. Um, six catches for 121 and a touchdown um, on eight targets. I think he's the guy you want in DFS this week. Only $5,000. That's a super reasonable price tag. Not interested in anybody else. Um, Tommy Fedoni, the tight end, $4,200. It's a little bit overpriced, in my opinion. I would have interest if you were priced below like $3,500. But I, if you're going to play a tight end on this slate, just play Justin Jolly at $3,800, in my opinion. All right, next up, we have Western Michigan heading to the old horseshoe to take on Ohio State. Ohio State is 37 and a half point favorites with a total of 53 and a half, meaning the projected total is about a 45 to 8 in favor of the Buckeyes. For Western Michigan, Hayden Wolf is their starting quarterback. Um, they hung around against Wisconsin. They really showed out well. And Hayden Wolf still only put up four fancy points. Um, just not in play for me. Ohio State's a good defense. Not a big passing volume team. I'll catch back up with him in action. I'll, I'll play him in November. At the running back spot, though, I do have a little interest in Jalen Buckley, only because of the workload that he's going to get. Against Wisconsin, he had 16 carries. He scored twice, put up 21 fancy points. Um, you're telling me we got a back here who's probably going to touch the ball 20 times at a salary of $5,000. I know it's a bad matchup, but – He's probably going to make my player pool for that reason alone. At the wide receiver spot, Kenneth Womack is likely to miss this game again. He is their best playmaker out wide. The three starters in his place would be Sam Bucci, Dudon, and Mortimer. Mortimer was the guy who filled in the Womack role. Um, look, it's not a high-volume passing offense. They're not likely to have a lot of success. Sam Bucci, Dudon, and Mortimer are the three guys. They're probably not going to make my player pool. On the Ohio State side, this feels a lot like last week against Akron, where we know this team is going to score points. We don't know how they're going to score points. They can probably score points any way they want to score. All right. So against Akron, Will Howard um, did have three passing touchdowns on not a lot of passing volume. Um, did not score a rushing touchdown for us. Um, the running backs, Judkins and Henderson, Judkins was able to find the end zone once. Henderson was not able to find the end zone. Um, so really, like, you're just betting on a touchdown score if you're playing the Ohio State guys, in my opinion. Um, at the running back spot, Judkins and Henderson, they're way too expensive to justify playing, knowing that they're going to split carries um, in this game. To me, they're GPP flyers where you just hope that you play one of them and he's the guy that scores three touchdowns. And then the wide receiver spot. I think the pendulum has swung too far in Jeremiah Smith. Um, yes, he is supremely talented. Nine targets, six catches, 92 yards, two touchdowns against Akron. He was great, 27 fantasy points. But I don't know why he's priced higher than Emeka Ibuka already. Ibuka still had seven targets in that game. Ibuka is still the more proven player. 
you're really just hedging a bet on who scores a touchdown. And, I, and to me, Smith and Igbuka are about equally as likely. So I think they should be close to equally priced, whereas you've got Smith um, ahead of Igbuka here on this slate. Um, like I said, if you're playing an Ohio State guy, you're just betting on him to score one, two, three touchdowns. And I think they're GPP plays. I don't think they're cash game plays. Next up, we have Houston heading to um, Norman to take on the Sooners. And this game is probably going to be one of the ugliest of the slate. Oklahoma is 28 and a half point favorites, total of 49 and a half, meaning the projected score is about 39 to 11 in favor of the Sooners. And look, Houston, very few teams look worse than Houston last week. They really laid an egg against UNLV. They played three quarterbacks in that game. Donovan Smith was the returning starter, got benched mid game for Zeon Chris, who got benched mid game for Uwe Alley. Not interested in the quarterbacks, even though Smith is really, really lowly priced. I don't know he's going to play the whole game, so I can't play him. At the running back spot, super low volume rushing attack. Um, Parker Jenkins is their lead back. He had two carries against UNLV. Um, Stacy Sneed is their second running back. He had two carries against UNLV. Sanford is their third back. He had four carries against UNLV. Not playing a Houston running back because when they're down, they're not going to run the football. The wide receiver spot, the three starters are Manjack, Johnson, and Wilson. Maybe take a shot at him as one-off plays, but I think there's better points per dollar plays out there. You don't need the quarterback to play the whole game if you play one of these wide receiver stuff. You know they're going to be down. You know they're going to be throwing. That, that's why I think they make the most sense as one-off plays, in my opinion. Um, but I'm still probably not going to play a whole lot of them. Maybe just a little bit of man check, if I'm being honest. On the Oklahoma side, I do like Jackson Arnold still. I think he's a little overpriced, but he does give you rushing upside as well as passing upside. This offense is going to score a ton of points. He didn't put up a lot of yards against Temple because Temple kept giving them the football in Temple territory for whatever reason. Um, so there will be more yards coming, and you know that if they're projected to score 39 points, there's upside for Arnold to score four, maybe five touchdowns. I don't think he's a bad option at ninety eight hundred dollars. I would rather play Milrow at a similar price tag, but I don't mind Arnold. I think he will be much less owned than Milrow as well. At the running back spot, everybody thought this was going to be Gavin Salchuk's backfield this year, after how he finished last year, but it really wasn't in Week One. He only saw six carries. Javante Barnes saw five, and then Taylor Tatum, the freshman, saw four. This just looks like it's going to be a split, and, and I'm probably going to wait until we get to conference play and we get some clarity on who the guy is in this backfield before I play him at DFS. If you're playing GPPs, Taylor Tatum at $3,200 might be worth a click, though, if you don't like any of the other salary savers that we talked about in this episode. At the wide receiver spot, Nick Anderson might not play. Julio Farouk is not going to play which leaves a clear target void to go to Deion Burks. And I think at $7,500, I think he's objectively one of the best receiver plays in, on the slate. I think in terms of top wide receivers on the slate, I'd have it as Concepcion at the top. I'd probably have it as Burks second. Um, he's going to get a ton of targets. He's going to get a ton of looks. $7,500 is not an unreasonable price tag to pay. To me, the, the injuries to Farouk and Anderson bring in Brendan Thompson and Andrew Anthony as plays as well. Neither of them really impressed in week one. But if Farouk and Anderson are out, somebody's got to play the snaps. Somebody's got to get the targets. And so I don't mind going with either of the two of them. Bauer Sharp at tight end is worth a look as well. Um, definitely going to see some usage in the red zone. Oklahoma loves to do, use their tight ends in the red zone. Don't mind him at $3,900. Now, the last game of the night is App State heading to Clemson to take on Clemson. And look, I got to say, if you're an athletic director, why in the world are you scheduling App State to come to your place in the non-conference? How many times do we have to see this App State program go into big-time Power 4 opponents and either knock them off like they did to Texas A&M, like they did to Michigan, or give them a scare like they did to North Carolina a few years back, like they did to Penn State a few years back? I think this is a very poor scheduling job by the Clemson AD. I think App State is a very live team in this game. Um, Clemson is 17-point favorites. The total is 52-and-a-half. The projection is 35-18 to 18 in favor of Clemson. And really, this game is going to be about this question in terms of whether or not you play these guys in your lineups on both sides. Is Georgia that good, or is Clemson just that bad? If you think Clemson is bad, play the App State guys. If you think Georgia is just really, really good, play some Clemson guys, typically a running back that we're going to talk about. On the App State side, Joey Aguilar is a really good G5 quarterback. Um, not super mobile, but he can run a little bit. He had 37 fancy points against um, East Tennessee State. If he is able to get two, three touchdowns, he can give you value in this one. So this is making a bet on the App State offense as a whole if you want to play Aguilar. At the running back spot, it's a little bit of a committee, but the committee is led by Kanye Roberts. 
I'd be much more interested in playing the passing game on this App State side than the running game because I think they are a little bit overmatched on the line in that regard. In the passing game, the good news is this App State offense is pretty darn condensed to four receiving options. you got Robinson, Horn, Jackson, and then the tight end, Eli Wilson. All four of them are going to be out on the field a lot. All four of them are going to get targets. Very few other players play. Um, last year, Robinson was the guy. Two years ago, Christian Horn was the guy. So I do think that there is some upside for both of them specifically. But we know who the ball's going to go to. And so if you're playing the App State passing game, Robinson, Horn, Jackson, Wilson, don't try to get cute with the other guys. Play one, maybe two of them. They're very reasonably priced, and you can definitely get to them. On the Clemson side, Kate Klubnick is still a quarterback. He was dreadful against Georgia. You're going to need a big-time bounce-back game from him. I would be interested in him if he was priced at $7,000. But, like, you look at where he's priced around at $8,500, and there's just a lot of guys below him that I'd rather play. I'd rather play Jaywin Daniels. I'd rather play um, Nico $100 more. I'd rather play Grayson McCall $1,000 less, Anthony Calandria $1,000 less, J.C. French $2,000 less. Like, there's just better plays out there than Club Nick, in my opinion. At the running back spot, though, I love Phil Maffa. He was a workhorse back against Georgia. It just didn't turn into a whole lot of fancy success because it's Georgia. But now he's going up against App State. They're favored. They should lean on this ground game. They have an advantage on the offensive and defensive lines in this game. They should use Phil Maffa to put up a ton of points in this game, in my opinion. The wide receiver spot for Clemson is still a little bit in flux. You've got a little bit of a rotation, some banged up guys. Antonio Williams was the best one against Georgia. Tower Brown is also going to be a starter. Bryant Wesco is a super talented freshman who played a decent amount of snaps but didn't really turn into a whole lot. And then you got Brenning Stool, the tight end. If you're looking to play this Clemson passing attack, Williams would probably be the guy you'd have to go with. All right, but that is going to do it for the Saturday night slate. Reminder, if you do want more from me, make sure you check out um, – the Fancy Corner Discord. Make sure you check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. Also, if you're trying anything new this week, we're partnering with Sign Up Expert. And what Sign Up Expert does is give you the best promo codes um, for new users on any um, DFS player proper sports book site. So um, head on over there if you're looking to sign up for something new this week, signupexpert.com slash Mike's Picks. It'll even sync to your location, so it'll show you what is only available in your area, legal in your state or province. All right, so that's going to do it for this week, y'all. Um, the night slate, like I said, this is a great slate. I, I really like this slate a lot. There's a lot of options. It's going to be like a, you know, if, as somebody who plays a 20 max generally, it's going to be a lot of like swapping in and out, game stack, one off, game stack, one off, right? Like just playing these different options. And I think there's a lot. I, I really do like this slate. I'm really looking forward to playing it. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's pretty much all I got this week, y'all. If this helped you out in any way, please hit the like button. Please subscribe. Please share with a friend. It helps, helps me out a ton when you guys do that, and I really do appreciate it. But that's all we got for this episode. Um, so hopefully I was able to give you guys some good information to help make your lineups here for this Saturday night slate. Best of luck to you guys this week on both the main slate and the Saturday night slate. Check out the main slate video if you have not already. But thank you guys for watching and listening to this point, and I will see you guys next time.